Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 32nd meeting of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee for 2018. Can we please ensure that all electronic devices are on silent mode? Agenda one, item one is, a, is um, a decision on whether to take item three in private. Item three is a discussion on our approach to stage two of the Age of Criminal Responsibility Scotland Bill. Can I ask committee members for any comments? Indeed, um, I raised um, last week in the public session my concerns about our evidence taking in relation to this bill and asked for us to look at it again. Um, and on reflection and after discussion with other committee members, I am content to take this item in private today. Thank you. Has the committee agreed to take in private? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Agenda item two is um, an oral evidence session with the Young Women Lead Committee of the YWCA Scotland Young Women's Movement. Young Women Lead is a programme for young women aged 30 and under living in Scotland. The programme is aimed at increasing parliamentary knowledge, engagement and leadership. In June, the first Young Women Lead Committee published a report on sexual harassment in schools and we have a, some of the committee members here today. Um, we would like to welcome Dr Patricia Kupiak, um, Director YWCA Scotland, the Young Women's Movement and Audrey Opdyke barnes um, a committee member from Young Women Lead. Um, can I invite Dr Kupiak to make opening remarks of up to five minutes, please? Of course, thank you. Uh, thank you for having us here representing Young Women Lead programme. So Young Women Lead was created from a need to address the underrepresentation of young women in politics and from young women telling us that they lack confidence to access political spaces. Working with the Scottish Parliament, YWCA Scotland, the Young Women's Movement, designed and delivered a leadership programme for young women under the age of 30. And in the pilot year, last year, we had 30 participants from diverse communities who came together in the Parliament to run their own committee inquiry. In committee meetings chaired by Deputy Presiding Officer Linda Fabiani, participants took evidence and questioned Scottish Government officials. They carried out engagement work across Scotland in new and innovative ways before producing a report with recommendations to the Scottish Government. Their chosen topic of inqu inquiry was sexual harassment in schools, and it looked at their local communities and lived experiences. With a desire to eliminate harassment in schools, the young woman recognised that this behaviour is often intersectional and incorporates racism, disablism and homophobia. Over the course of their inquiry, they came up with innovative ways and ideas to eliminate bullying, harassment and discrimination in Scottish schools, ranging from providing safe spaces to additional training for teachers and ensuring an inclusive approach recognising different needs of different groups. The final report was presented to the Scottish Government in June and the Deputy, Prese Deputy First Minister committed to engage seriously on the contents of its report. Uh, so we really welcome the opportunity to be here today uh, and to see what action has been taken uh, since June this year uh, and what are the key actions that are going to be taken in the next six months to address sexual harassment in Scottish schools. Okay, thank you very much. Can I um, start things off by just asking why you chose the topic of sexual harassment? So uh, in the beginning of our planning, we were allowed to choose the topic we were going to research and ultimately we all came together and chose sexual harassment in schools because it was something that had impacted everyone present, uh, not just within our school experience, but beyond and how we behaved uh, going into university or careers, um, even just holding us back in with anxiety and recovery so going and we realized that if we studied that and came back with feedback for the current context with far more digital media interaction at schools we might be able to save the next generation from having the same impact that we suffered in our lives it might be something that would surprise people who don't have um, young women or girls in their lives just how rife um, that type of sexual harassment is. Can you maybe speak to some of the experiences or, or behaviours that, that affect the, the young women that you, you clearly said you'd all been impacted by? Yeah, um, I mean, content warning was issued because some of it did get quite challenging to listen to. Um, anything as simple as just pinging of the bra, to be honest, uh, can have an impact on a girl feeling shy or that she needs to hide herself. Uh, 
to the unconscious bias coming through on preferences uh, in classrooms straight through to sexual assault. Uh, a fair few of us had experienced that and in decent uh, contact where we weren't able to report it and it wasn't taken seriously enough because it hadn't been seen. Um, you spoke about um, the engagement that the committee had, had undertaken. Can you talk a little bit more about that, who you, who you spoke with and how you, how you engaged with them? Sure. Um, so it's, we started with a questionnaire and survey and we worked with uh, parliamentary researchers, um, finding out who would be the best to work with from that point. And so lots of external organisations that work on gender and human rights and bullying. Um, and from there, we designed a full-on campaign, which was digital outreach with surveys, asking for personal experiences, feedback, and also focus groups. We went out all across Scotland, up to Orkney, and the Western Isles, the Highlands, the uh, Central Belt, the borders. We covered it as much as we could um, and chatted with everyone about their experience in a safe space with advice. And you mentioned there that um, obviously some of the, the, the well, it's, it's an upsetting topic anyway, and I think that um, one of the upsetting aspects is how normalised it is. And I don't know, I mean, was how did you support women as, er, and, and girls as they were sharing within your groups? Was it a, quite a challenging thing to do? Was it the first time for some people that they'd spoken openly about it? If you just... Absolutely. And I think uh, there's a differentiation that needed to be made in the central belt, and especially Edinburgh and Glasgow, we're far more in aware of that conversation. Up in more rural, small communities, um, that conversation was entirely new. So we, the safety of the participants and those get, uh, giving evidence very much had to be secured, but we, we had advice again from parliamentary researchers and 30 party organisations. We worked quite hard to make sure everyone was safe. Thank you. Um, and were you surprised by the, the, the changes that um, girls made to their lifestyle and their actions to avoid that type of behaviour? Was it examples of, of them making different choices that, you know, of, of them preventing partake, participating fully in things? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and, it's, and it's where that sort of intersectional uh, approach comes into play because we've seen such differences in different communities uh, and how different communities and how different young girls reacted to sexual harassment and uh, having the confidence to report it or to even speak about it with their friends or their families varied across uh, different communities. Um, so yeah, we've noticed like from there, from the information that we got that many girls were trying to make themselves the, themselves smaller or um, they were scared to take up too much space after uh, experiencing sexual harassment. So they will try to be quiet in school. Um, they wouldn't engage in as many activities outside of the school. So there was definitely impact uh, on their day-to-day -day lives, but also uh, on their performance at school and like kind of relationship with their families and friends. Uh, and even from like Audrey described some of those instances that I think most of us experience like bra pulling or, you know, bra straps pulling or, you know, pulling your skirt or things like that, that uh, had actually a huge impact on, on their performance in schools. So it wasn't just instances of sexual assault uh, that were impacting on their lives. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, just to further on that, even within our participant group, having... For, for some of us, we'd all been very working quite hard, quite accomplished young women who were really passionate about this, but still hadn't had a space that was that safe to then all of a sudden be honest and recognise the way that they, we had been targeted. Um, so the behaviour in us has changed, and knowing that we now have the power to go out and make a change for other girls. So, yeah. Thank you. I think your, your report and your reflections show the urgency of of addressing this because I think we can't have um, half our population missing out on fully participating because of these things. Thank you. Gail Ross. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Thank you for coming in. Um, I was I was really interested in um, what you said about the, the recognition of what this actually is as sexual harassment. 
What changes would you like to see in the staff and teacher approach mm -hmm. to even just recognising that these instances have to be um, reported as, as sexually or, or gender based rather than just, you know, kind of brushing them off as tends to happen? Yeah. Um, so I think like one of the main recommendations was actually to standardise reporting procedures. So they're the same across different schools. Because uh, one thing that really struck me from reading the report and the responses that we got uh, was one participant called it postcode lottery. So if you're really lucky and in your, in your school there are those reporting procedures and the teachers adhere to them, um, then any sexual harassment that you report is going to be treated seriously. But if there isn't uh, such procedure, um, then you're just left with reporting it and nothing gets done. And that for a victim uh, or a survivor of sexual harassment is even worse, like the impact that it has on them uh, mentally and psychologically uh, is really serious. Um, so that's definitely one of the recommendations. Another recommendation that came from the group was to um, provide training for teachers and to have like that one sort of uh, key person uh, that you can report sexual harassment to. And, and from teachers, and interestingly enough, because we had over 60 teachers participating in the survey as well, uh, they said that the training should be across the board. So it shouldn't just be one teacher, it should be all teachers who have awareness of what sexual, sexual harassment is. Uh, to make reporting easier for the victims so they don't feel like they have to go into a lot of detail um, that, that there is an understanding in the school of what constitutes sexual harassment. And obviously um, the, the sexual harassment has, has two parties involved. So obviously we want to support the, the girls that have been the target. But how do we re-educate the people that are perpetrating the sexual harassment in the first place? Yeah, I think that would be a question of having more sort of standardised sexual education that actually looks at consent and sexual harassment in, in all of its forms uh, and across the board uh, in Scottish schools. Like I think we have a really good opportunity um, to do something quite revolutionary in Scotland and to look at kind of intersectional approaches um, to reporting um, sexual harassment in the same way that we were kind of revolutionary with domestic abuse bill. Like I think there is a real opportunity to do something because otherwise we are failing our young people. And do you think that that's something that could be slotted into uh, PSE lessons or should it be something that's more across the curriculum as a whole? I think it should be across the, the curriculum because it's going to affect people in all of the subjects that they take and all of their extracurricular activities. If that's something that happens in school, uh, I think it should be across the board. And that's that's also what's coming from teachers that participated in the survey that it needs to be all teachers who are educated on that, on that topic, um, not just a teacher for sexual education specifically. Yeah. Um, and, and just finally, um, just looking for a kind of general overview of how you felt um, taking part in, I mean, obviously you, you did so much work, so many engagements and spoke to so many people. I'm going to ask you, was it worthwhile? I know what the answer is going to be, but, but how... How would you encourage this now to move on? Would you like to see it happening again and maybe focus on a different topic? And, and how would you like to see this moving on in the future? Well, on this particular topic, um, Young Women League will continue and the next cohort's already started and they'll be focusing on a new topic that they are to decide. Um, it was incredibly worthwhile for a personal note. I was a participant and now I'm the programme coordinator. I feel invested and believe in every young woman I've interacted with. Um, but yeah, going back to the topic, we research the sexual harassment in schools. I think this is something that needs to be an ongoing conversation. We live in a very much an evolving context you know, in terms of technology, how we interact with each other, uh, migration and demographic change. Even the definition itself is going to need to be under continuous review as we get more insight into how these things work. Um, of course, uh, as something that Alex Cole Hamilton, you mentioned uh, to uh, Christina McKelvey uh, last week, I think, that it needs to be co-creation. It needs to bring the young people in to be involved in defining what this is and giving their input. Um, it was clearly a big subject that 
most people, most young women really, really wanted someone to start the conversation in because around the same time, Girl Guides started a similar research topic. They were able to access different, uh, different sources of information. So the two together was greater than the sum of their parts. And I think that is proof that this needs to continue. It needs to be under continuous review. Um, and if every year we came back to this conversation, then we'd be headed in the right direction. Keith Fulton. Hey, good, good morning, panel. I just want to uh, congratulate you on the, the work that you're doing and, uh, on your report. So just a, a very general question for me to start off with. You might be aware that we've got the Deputy First Minister um, in after yourself today. Is there any questions that you would like us as, as the committee to ask him on your behalf? We have quite a few, actually. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, so the first question would be, um, the schools are not reporting uh, sexual harassment that kind of came out of the, after the report and the survey uh, because of reputation. Uh, so uh, how does the Deputy First Minister is planning to hold them to account uh, and to standardise reporting procedures? And then what actions were taken in the last six months and what are the key actions that will be taken in the next six months? So in June, it will be a year since we first presented the findings of the report. So we're really keen to know uh, what's been done since we presented it and what's going to happen in the next couple of months. Um, and kind of on a more, I guess, personal level, are there any parts of the report that really struck him? Is that something that uh, he wasn't aware of or things that he wished that he had known sooner uh, to take action on, on these? Um, and also what's been done to recognize additional factors in harassment? Uh, so going back to that sort of intersectional approach, like how, how are we going to address that to make sure that uh, things are not brushed under the carpet? And yeah, and have, has he has he seen the report? Uh, we know that he answered about the report in the chamber, but are there any sort of findings from the report that he thought were particularly important to address uh, as soon as possible? Thanks very much for that. Yeah. That's, um, I'll, I'll take that um, as I'm sure all our committee members into the <coughs> the next session. Have you have we got in time for another wee? Quick question, you can be no. Thanks very much. I just wanted to, <clears throat> obviously, one of your main aims is is getting women under thirty more involved in politics. What um, effect do you think sexual harassment in schools has on that? Yeah. Um, I think from the start, if if um, if anyone is being targeted for who they are, any aspect of who they are, including gender from a young age, it conditions you to be quieter, to want to disappear, so that you're not a visible target for this to continue happening. Uh, biases are being pushed at you, and you start thinking, well, oh, I'm subservient, uh, or just quiet, muted. And by the time you get to the age where you're thinking, I want to start, go to university, or I want to stand for community council, or I just want to raise my voice and take part, <laughs> even vote, uh, you start thinking you're, vo you're not informed enough, you're not wise enough. Mm. That's taking up space you've not earned and you really question the validity of you occupying space in this country, in this world. So it definitely plays on women, to, it plays into women getting involved in politics because it all starts young. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Alec. Thank you very much, Kamina. Good morning to the panel. It's great to hear your evidence. It's been riveting so far. Um, I'd like to talk about the spectrum that exists between sexual harassment and sexual exploitation, and they are inexorably linked, and particularly in the forums we've discussed. Uh, and I think more recently we've seen the prevalence of online sexual exploitation, of uh, sexting, of uh, taking photo, having inappropriate images used as a tool of control over people. Um, and I just wanted to know whether you think that our schools are adequately addressing in sexual education the culture of healthy respect, what healthy uh, romantic or non-romantic relationships look like, and whether children in our schools know what to do if they um, are a victim either of sexual harassment or sexual exploitation. Um, so I think from the report, it was clear that in terms of kind of healthy relationship and consent, uh, that was part of the curriculum that um, that was lacking. Uh, that was young people telling us that 
um, that they didn't feel it was addressed uh, in an adequate fashion uh, in their sexual sex education. So they were looking to other sources like online or, you know, speaking with their peer networks. And then it, again, depends kind of on the community that they are in and the stuff that they are finding online. So that was definitely one of the recommendations to uh, look at consent and what constitutes a healthy relationship and sort of the levels of respect that... Um, that you should get from your partner at, at any age uh, and the ways how to protect yourself uh, both online and offline uh, should be included in more depth uh, and sex education in schools across across Scotland. Um, again, referring to something you did last week, uh, co-creation, uh, bringing the young people in. It's very hard for teachers who are not digital natives mm. living in that context and interacting with that technology to know the nuances of what's going on in these mm. conversations. Uh, I, I remember in high school, I didn't have Facebook, and I'm so grateful, because I could leave school at school. I could leave whatever was going on at school. Nowadays, they can't. And it's going on to Instagram, Twitter, every social media platform that pops up is now another channel th through which people can target. I have great conversations too, but also very much target each other because that's what happens when you're young. Thank you. One of the most insidious aspects of child sexual exploitation is that victims don't often recognise their victimhood. Um, and as such, you know, they're less likely to be forthcoming to an adult about it because, uh, for example, sexual harassment, the of the bra strap, for example, you would potentially go and tell a teacher and that, that might be addressed. But if somebody thinks they're in love with somebody, um, they might just tell their peers. What support are we giving children to be supportive peers to say that relationship's not right? You know, what does he actually want from you, considering he's 10 years older? What, what kind of support are we giving to peers to support each other? Because they may not come forward to teachers. I think that goes back to kind of standardized sex education as well, addressing some of these things. Um, because the people who participated in the research, they said that the first person that they would probably speak with, for majority of them, would be their peer network. It wouldn't be a teacher, it wouldn't be a parent, it would be their friend. So if their friend is kind of not equipped with, with that knowledge and not knowing what the next steps are going to be, even knowing who is the teacher that you should be speaking with, or even knowing if those behaviors are kind of controlling abusive behaviors, or if it's just something that it's normal uh, in a relationship when you're going through being in a relationship for the first time in your life. Um, then it's really difficult for that young person to address it and we shouldn't expect them to have the responsibility to be able to address it. And I think that's why one of the recommendations was to provide safe spaces for young people in their schools when they can come together with support of perhaps a guidance teacher or someone who received training um, on those issues to be able to speak openly with their peer networks and to be able to get that peer-to-peer -peer support because these are the first people that they're going to speak about any instances about uh, of sexual harassment that they're experiencing. And another point is, um, I guess, making sure that the definition of sexual harassment, again, is standardized and it's very clear. Uh, so young people are not questioning whether something that they are experiencing is actually harassment. They're not thinking this is just a normal behavior or, you know, boys will be boys or, you know, whatever the phrases people use, that they actually have a really clear understanding that this behavior is not acceptable. And final question, if I may, convener. Audrey Updike Barnes, you um, reference the fact that you're, you're not a, a native to the information superhighway and none of us are, but, um, but our children are. Um, and as such, I think, you know, it's fair to say that the, for all, with the best will in the world, the policy strata that exists to address child sexual exploitation or online sexual harassment um, are, are made up of people in their 40s and 50s who are still feeling their way through a lot of these uh, social media platforms. Do you think we should be doing more to enlist young people into the policy making processes so they say, ah, well, you know, there's this new kind of abuse or a new online platform which is on the dark web or hidden, for, which can get around parental safeguards. Do you think we need to do more to involve children and young people in that process? Absolutely. Um, I'm even just to have a, if you created a room where there was a workshop to talk about what do you do online and share hints and tips, you're going to get insight. The conversation's going to go in a direction where you're, you're going, oh, that was a channel I didn't know we were using now. 
have those conversations, bring them into a forum and it can start as an enjoyable conversation and you'll understand things a bit more. Not necessarily explicitly looking for uh, harmful interactions, but just to gain an understanding of that highway. Thank you. Thank you, convener, and good morning to both of you. It's good to have you here this morning. Um, one of the recommendations from the work that you've done is that um, sex and relationship education should be standardised across the country. D do you think it is, that is truly achievable? Given that no two schools are the same, can you really achieve that standardisation across the country? I think that's what we should strive for, uh, because otherwise the experiences of young people in our country are going to be so different, and their access to education and safe education is going to be so different that I think even though it, it is going to be challenging, I think that there should be uh, a standardized, at least standardized reporting uh, and standardized information that should be included uh, in sex ed curriculum across Scotland. Um, and definitely standardized training for teachers as well, so they know how to recognize sexual harassment. Um, and finally, standardized reporting. That was one thing that came coming up again and again and again from communities across Scotland, that sometimes it would be from school to school, sometimes there will be, you know, the distance between them would be half an hour, but the outcomes for the young people reporting sexual harassment would be completely different and would impact their lives uh, in completely different ways. So I think if we don't have those standardized procedures, then we risk failing young people in Scotland. Okay. Audrey, any follow comments? No, I completely agree with uh, Patricia's statements there. It's fair enough to say um, it's unachievable, but it's worth trying. We can't. When your, your survey showed that 45% of students and 48% of teachers <coughs> don't think that the curriculum <coughs> ad adequately covers, excuse me, uh, adequately covers consent, <coughs> do you think in some ways that is a benefit? Because clearly if, if there is currently a lack in, in the way training and, and, and awareness raising is done, it's easier to do a radical refresh or are there, th there are things from the, the training that's currently in place that, that could almost be pulled out and um, refreshed and used? The training for teachers, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be so sure. I'd, um, I'm not entirely sure sort of what's the scope of training that it's, yeah. that it's now being offered uh, other than young people who participated in the report and also the teachers who contributed to, re to the report saying that, that they don't feel at the moment it's enough and that, that we need to do more. Um, so I think we can be quite radical with what we do. Like I think we have a real opportunity uh, to do something that is really going to affect change for young people in Scotland. Okay. Um, and you've also made a recommendation that um, raising awareness and education should start in primary schools. Um, do you think that will be a harder task to roll this out in primary schools? Or do you think the earlier you start um, to embed this kind of education, um, it will almost be easier as you take it forward? Yeah, I think the main challenge would probably be uh, getting parents on board uh, for uh, earlier sex education. But I think you're absolutely right on your second point. The earlier we start having those conversations, uh, the more likely it is that the outcomes for young people will be improved. Um, and also we, for this report, we looked at secondary schools and up, uh, but we started recently working with Rape Crisis Prevention Unit uh, because they work with P7 uh, students as well and they've already been reporting instances of what we recognize as sexual harassment so we know it's already happening to re really young people much younger age group than than we targeted for this particular report so i think it's important to start those conversations early because as audrey was saying before once you're conditioned to kind of expect those kind of behaviors and once you start making yourself smaller that, that starts in primary school, that starts at a really early age, and it's much harder, I think, to reverse that, rather than trying to target it as early as possible. Yeah, I, uh, I, would, I would even go so far as to say that that's what the teachers were referring to when they said that it wasn't enough, um, and that consent 
and tackling things that are uh, not the reactive, almost. Being proactive and starting young and having those conversations about what's a healthy communication, what's healthy relationships, what's a healthy interaction. Um, it's being preventative uh, and makes it such a, so much more healthy uh, in handling the education later on in life. Um, doesn't need to be explicit sex ed as you would conventionally think of it, uh, but communication, interaction, culture, society. Yeah. And the, the point you make about parents, I think, is an interesting one because I'm, I, I, I'm unaware um, the involvement that parent councils and parent forums have um, in the um, in, in the rollout or, or the, tr the training and, and awareness raising of this. Um, but I certainly would think, and, and I would hope that you would agree, that involving parent councils and parent forums, perhaps even in taking part in, in, in the training, would, would be good. Um, and it, it may also help to start conversations that parents have with other parents about what they perhaps should be looking out for in, in their own children. I definitely agree. Uh, and for a young person, they need to have that support at home as well. So that, that education doesn't, doesn't finish in, in the classroom. They, they need to have that support from their parents and their parents being educated and understanding sort of different ways that sexual harassment can affect young people. And again, going back to the point of, you know, being uh, natives and digital communications, parents having an understanding of those ever-changing platforms, I think would be very helpful. So yeah, definitely, that's, that's one thing that we would definitely recommend. Thank you. Okay, Oliver. <coughs> Thank you, Convener. My kind of principal question has been uh, covered already, but it was just a sort of quick question following up uh, really on uh, your response to Fulton and some of the other things. Do you think that the pace of progress has been quick enough, or after six months, you know, would you have hoped more of the recommendations would have been prioritised? Um, so other than, than that uh, comment from the... Um, Deputy First Minister in June, uh, we haven't heard anything anything else in terms of the progress uh, addressing that particular topic. Uh, we know that there is uh, new reporting recommendations on bullying that was rolled out in autumn, uh, but we didn't really see kind of specifically gendered or uh, sexual harassment angle to it. Um, but we know that it's something that the work is really recent, uh, so it's something, I guess, that remains to be seen how sexual harassment will become a part of reporting for that particular scheme. Um, but from the young women that we spoke with for the report and after the report was launched, they said that they didn't feel that reporting mechanisms in general uh, were particularly effective and they didn't feel confident to, to report instances of sexual harassment. So we're hoping that there will be an action that will be taken uh, in the next couple of months to really start addressing that issue. Because it's, and it's, you know, from speaking with other people, like people are telling us that this is the same stuff that I experienced in schools, you know, 20, 30 years ago. People are surprised that some of the things that are coming up are exactly the same as their experience. So we really don't want to wait another 20, 30 years and just see that the situation is still the same or maybe progressively worse. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Annie. Um, you mentioned earlier about the definition of sexual harassment and in your report you had said that it would be it should be clear to students and staff as to what constitutes sexual harassment so in the definition of, of it what should it include? I think um, what we would recommend is to have a wider conversation with survivors I don't think, as, even as a group of 30 young women, many of whom had experience of sexual harassment, uh, we would feel confident kind of coming up with a definition that includes all of the different levels of sexual harassment. I think it requires a much wider conversation uh, and co-design co and co-production with survivors and with young people who are currently experiencing uh, sexual harassment in schools. But I think that definition should have all of the elements of sexual harassment, it should be really clear so the young person, when they look at it, they know straight away whether it's something that they have experienced, they don't question it, uh, they don't feel scared to report it because they are unsure whether it's just a normal behavior or if it's actually someone targeting them because of their gender. Um, 
so yeah, my recommendation would be to do a much sort of wider exercise to come up with that definition because we've been looking for it and we've noticed that you know there isn't like one ideal definition. That's why I think it, there needs to be a wider conversation around that topic. And just one more small bit. Yeah. And do you think there should be a specific definition for like schools about what sexual harassment constitutes, or is it the wider public sort of a? definition of it or should there be one specifically for for schools i think there should be a, a wider definition because then it means that when you leave school when you go into your first workplace or any sort of other interactions that you have with other human beings whether it's being in relationships you actually know what to, what a healthy relationship should be uh, what consent means so i think there is a need to create that definition that is that is much wider and i think school context is not different from any context like there'll be the same behaviors that that you will see outside of school thank you okay well that's us at the the end of our our session thank you very much for your report and for your for your evidence it's been it's been really valuable and i'm sure that um colleagues will put your yeah. questions to the the deputy first minister in our next session we're now going to suspend briefly for a for a comfort break
Okay. Welcome back, everyone, and can I welcome Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills to the committee um, to give evidence. We have um, John Swinney um, and his officials, Laura Meikle, Head of Support and Wellbeing Unit, Stuart Downs, Interim Policy, Policy Manager at Scottish Government, and I understand you'd like to make some opening remarks. Uh, I would, Kavir. Um, good morning. I welcome this opportunity to update the committee on the Scottish Government's response to the recommendations of the Young Women Lead Committee's report on sexual harassment in schools. Let me start by reaffirming the Government's commitment to end violence against women and girls, including sexual harassment. It is one of the most devastating and fundamental violations of human rights, and it needs to stop. Children and young people should feel nurtured, safe, respected and included in their learning environment, and all staff should be proactive in promoting positive relationships and behaviour in the classroom, playground and wider learning community. No pupil should feel threatened or harassed at school. I acknowledge the seriousness of the issues that the Young Women Lead Committee have raised, and I'm grateful to them for the insight that they have provided. I also express my appreciation to Linda Fabiani and to Christina McKelvey and members of the Equality and Human Rights Committee for the continued focus that this issue is attracting within the committee. I previously assured Linda Fabiani that this government would engage seriously on the contents of the Young Women Lead Committee report. I'm therefore pleased to set out today the work the government is undertaking to deliver the committee's recommendations. I do, however, recognise that we may not have time to discuss the Government's response to each of the report's 15 recommendations, and I would be happy, in light of questioning, to write to the Committee with any further information that the Committee would wish to hear from the Government. I accept that the availability of clear guidance is vital if we are to effectively respond to incidents of sexual harassment in schools and intervene early to prevent the escalation of toxic behaviours. One of the immediate actions we are undertaking is the establishment of a personal and social education lead officers network, which will meet early in 2019. And the first aim of that network will be to take forward work to develop resources to support schools and pupils to tackle sexual harassment. We are also continuing our work to ensure teachers have up-to-date resources they need to teach relationships, sexual health and parenthood, or RSHP, education. A new web-based RHSP teaching resource has been developed by a partnership of health boards and local authorities. It is designed to fill gaps in teaching resources highlighted by, highlighted by teachers and pupils, including key messages on consent. It has currently been piloted and will be launched in 2019. We have also accepted recommendations from the LGBTI Inclusive Education Working Group and will be undertaking a review and update to the 2014 statutory guidelines on RH RSHP education. We will shortly be publishing our conclusions and recommendations from the Personal and Social Education PSE review. The review's recommendations will help us to strengthen PSE delivery and the wider network of pastoral guidance available to pupils. These interventions will strengthen the delivery of RSHP education, which is an integral part of the health and well-being area of Curriculum for Excellence, enabling children and young people to build healthy relationships, to recognise positive behaviours and to develop an understanding of consent and an awareness of the law on sexual behaviour. As part of our prevention work, we are also funding Rape Crisis Scotland to extend the delivery of their sexual violence prevention programme to public secondary schools in every local authority in Scotland. The Government is taking a cross-cutting approach to end sexual harassment and violence against women and girls that draws together the contributions of various policy areas including health, justice and education. The actions I am taking forward within my portfolio will ensure that our entire education system, from early years to schools as well as further and higher education, is a key contributor to this work with age and stage appropriate materials available throughout. The steps I have outlined today are part of the wider Getting It Right for Every Child agenda. We want every child or young person and their family to be offered the right help at the right time from the right people. This is essential if we are to end sexual harassment and violence against women and girls. I look forward to considering the Committee's conclusions on this subject, which will help inform the forthcoming work that the Government is undertaking. Okay, thank you, um, Cabinet Secretary. Can I ask for uh, an update on the recording of bullying incidents and whether this includes um, incidents of sexual harassment within it. And um, in our earlier session there um, with the Young Women's Committee, they mentioned um, that reporting um, 
wasn't happening due to fear of reputational damage from schools. So maybe just some reflections on how how um, schools can show leadership in, in tackling this. It's obviously never uncomfortable shining a light on things that we would rather not be happening, but um, just some reflections on that as well. I think there are two aspects to the question, Kavina, that I'd want to that I would want to put on the record. The first is a cultural point which addresses you, the, the, the latter point that you made to me, which is that I think it's important that there is a culture of open acknowledgement that these issues are taking place. And I think the Young Women's Lead Committee have done us a service by highlighting very directly some of these issues um, and very dramatically some of the content of these issues. And that has to prevail in all educational settings so that it is it's clear that uh, there are examples of this type of behaviour happening to therefore encourage a culture of open consideration and reporting. The second point is a practical point, which is that the CMIS uh, information system, which applies to all schools in Scotland, um, has been updated. There have been software changes made to ensure that we can record instances of um, uh, of bullying within our school system and uh, those examples uh, can properly be charted and give us an insight into the extent of, uh, of uh, the prevalence of these instances and therefore formulate whether there are further actions that need to be taken to address that and whether there is a, a, an incidence problem in, in one school uh, versus another school and from that we may deduce lessons to learn about the practices that may be taken forward in one school which are leading to a better ethos and culture than might be the case in another school. Thank you. Um, Gail Ross. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, um, Mr Swinney. Thank you very much for coming along. Um, you mentioned the um, PSE and the review that's ongoing at the moment and we asked um, Audrey and Patricia um, earlier whether they thought that PAC could be the only place to have the consent and um, sexual uh, discussion or whether that should go across the whole curriculum and they, they agreed that it should um, go across the curriculum rather than just be in one place. So I wonder if you could comment on that and I wonder if you could also comment on the PSC review in particular and give us an update on how that's going, um, any, any time scales and also the Again, we, we talked about consist consistency of reporting, but also consistency of how that message is getting out as well. Um, on the um, on the PSE review, um, the, the PSE review has been undertaken in three stages and three phases, and the final phase of that, um, I, I've just recently received the conclusions of that for me to consider. Uh, I've held off publishing that and concluding that because I wanted to come to the committee to hear the issues that have been raised and to give me a final opportunity to reflect on what is being presented to me as to whether, given the questions the committee puts to me, uh, as to whether I think the, the, the conclusions of the review are appropriate. So uh, that will influence my timescale for publication. It's, it's in a very advanced stage. Um, it conceivably could be published before Christmas, but I think I'll probably um, uh, reflect on it over the Christmas recess and publish it early in the new year. We gave a commitment to publish by the end of the year, but I think, I'll, given how close we are to recess, I think I might just take that time to, to reflect on it in the light of the committee's deliberations on this point. In relation to the question of whether PSE is the, the right place for this discussion to be had, I think it's important to uh, reflect on the fact that uh, Personal social education forms part of the health and well-being curricular area, one of the eight curricular areas of Curriculum for Excellence. Um, when I um, became the Education Secretary, I asked the Chief Inspector of Education to give guidance to the education system, which gave, which I thought was required, which gave greater prominence to literacy, numeracy and health and well-being amongst the eight curricular areas. And essentially the inference of that was that while the eight curricular areas are essential to provide holistic education for young people, there are three that are frankly more holistic than others, which are literacy, numeracy, and health and well-being. So there's a centrality to personal and social education within health and well-being. 
and a centrality of health and well-being to the curriculum. So I think what I, what I certainly think our, our current arrangements should provide for is the appropriate understanding and appreciation of the issues that arise out of um, personal social education should be available to all young people at every stage of their education from the early years right up to the senior phase and also, as a matter of fact, into uh, aspects of our higher and further education system. And that brings me on to a, 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 a part of that debate, which is, do I think all of the PSE elements are as um, appropriate and effective as they could be? And I think I have to accept that that's not the case, because I, the, the, the work that we're undertaking to review PSE, the work that we're undertaking to provide the, um, the materials on um, relationships, sexual health and parenthood, which are being developed, currently been piloted and developed, I think that acknowledges the fact that we believe there is work that has to be undertaken here to ensure that there is a wider appreciation of all of these issues within the education system. Now, that's important for a whole number of reasons. It's important just because it's important. It's important that everybody in life has an understanding of all of these issues and an appreciation of all of these issues. But it's particularly appropriate and important given the experience we are currently having as a country with the significant increase in sexual crimes. And the Solicitor General, and this brings me on, uh, Kavina, to my point about cross-portfolio working, the Solicitor General has convened some work because of her deep concern about the escalation in, it's not a concern about reporting, it's the, her deep concern about the instances of sexual, uh, of allegations of a sexual nature which are resulting in increased reporting to the Crown, uh, to the police and then to the, uh, for consideration by the Crown. And what the point the Solicitor General is making to me is that the criminal justice system um, will obviously be able to tackle all of these particular reports but it would be better for the health and well-being of our society if we were educating young people not to get involved in this activity in the first place. And that would be better all round for everybody. So I accept, you know, so when I look at the data which shows an increase in reporting of sexual crimes and instances of sexual crimes within our society, I accept there is a responsibility on the education system to play its part in trying to reduce that incidence by better education for young people. So, so that analysis brings me to the conclusion that this is something that needs to be considered in the space of preventative intervention to ensure that we're equipped to, to, to handle these issues properly. So I think that that's the, that's the approach that we're bringing to this work that's being undertaken to make sure we adequately equip young people with the children and young people with the knowledge of what is appropriate and what is inappropriate. And that's good and it's, it's important in itself, but it's critical in trying to reduce the instances of sexual, of alleged sexual crime within our society. Um, thank you. Just a, a small supplementary on that um, very point. Um, we talk often about the, the, the gap almost between what, what children are being taught in school and then what they experience in their home lives. How do we reach those parents that see these instances of what children are now going to be taught in school as sexual harassment as banter and they're getting two different messages from school and from home um, I think the I think that's a, a, a deeper cultural question within our society which we which we have to confront uh, I think a lot of what has happened as a consequence of the emergence of the focus on the me too movement I think has um, been a wake-up call to society in general and uh, I think the benefits of that I, I hope we see in our society where it is uh, more uh, visibly obvious and directly obvious as to you know what is unacceptable behaviour and um, so I think th th this is something that 
needs to be tackled in every aspect of society. Schools have got their part to play, but so has the home got to, a part to play. And of course, one of the, the key elements of our um, framework for education within Scotland is good, strong parental engagement and family engagement in learning. And I, I know that, and, and that, shouldn't, that should be across all aspects of a young person's education, and it's important that families understand what learning has been undertaken by young people within schools to be able to reinforce that within uh, within the home. You know, it applies, um, you know, the same issues apply about maths. Um, if a young person does maths at school and then goes home and gets told by their parents, you know, oh, maths is, you know, I'm never a maths person, maths is terrible, it has an effect. If a young person gets a message about um, sexual harassment in schools and goes home and gets told, oh, that's just banter, it has the same corrosive effect. So I completely accept the point. Um, but it's about changing societal attitudes on these questions. Annie Wells. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Deputy First Minister. Following on from um, Gail Ross's questions there, when we talk about some people say it's banter and some people say it's sexual harassment, as part of the, or the concluding part of the committee's report, it said that consistency is key in reporting sexual harassment. And they'd said that it should be clear to students and staff what the definition is of sexual harassment. So I suppose what I'm asking is, are we looking at a standardised um, definition of sexual harassment so that it is clear to parents and teachers and the pupils themselves and, and girls what's, what constitutes sexual harassment? And is the government working on that definition at the moment? I think this is a really difficult question. I think it gets to the nub of many of the issues that are at stake in this whole debate. Um, because if I can, and this is how I, I've been thinking long and hard about this question, because I, I think it, it, it does get to the nub of where we have to uh, go in this debate. And it's also influencing my thinking about the guidance and the PSE review contents. Fundamentally, there is a spectrum on this issue which starts with, if I use Annie Wells's term, light banter, and ends up with a sexual offence. Now, the sexual offences part of that are defined in law and statute, and the Crown will assess against those sexual offences. But on that spectrum, I find it quite difficult to work out where sexual harassment starts and stops, because all of it's unacceptable. So I, I, I found it quite, you know, I think we, we, we're in a situation today where our existing legal framework defines sexual offences. And obviously the government, I think the government's been pretty clear with Parliament that we will constantly keep under review the definition of sexual offences and indeed have legislated to strengthen provision where we thought that was necessary. Um, but to put another definition in there, I think runs the risk, and I'm not, I'm not for a moment suggesting that anyone else is putting this to me, runs the risk that some things be almost become defined by society as acceptable. And I don't, and I think that would be undesirable. So I, 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 I'm, I'm not giving a definitive answer to anyone else's question, but I, because I struggle to work out what we would, what we, how we would define it what I do think we have to do is we have to educate young people to have confidence in saying that something is not acceptable and to be prepared to raise that concern. It relates then directly back to the point the convener made to me at the outset of this session, because without that, then things will just muddle along as banter. And I think that's unacceptable. I just give me a, a short one. Um, the previous panel had said that when they were looking at the definition, they really want it, and it should be a wider conversation, and it should be victim-led. And would the Deputy First Minister consider going back to the committee and seeing what they would suggest as to who would be involved in that discussion to look at the, the victim-led side of things as well? I, 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 you know, I, I hope from the answer that I just gave to Annie Wells that I, 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 I left it pretty open. I'm, I'm open on this question. I, I've expressed my view to the committee about my reluctance to go into that territory of definition, but 
for, for the reasons that I've given. But I'm very happy to uh, reflect further on this issue. It's it's not one which I've got a fixed uh, a fixed view, other than the fact that I don't consider any of this behaviour to be acceptable. Thank you, Oliver Mandel. The brief supplementary. Thank you, convener. I just wondered to, whether the cabinet secretary would look, if you know, if he comes to the position where he wouldn't look at a fixed definition, whether he would look to draw up, even if it's a non-exhaustive list, but some very specific examples setting out things uh, that would clearly be wrong, particularly within a school or, or work setting, going back to some of the examples uh, that have been mentioned even today at committee. I, I, I think this, in a sense, gets into the territory of where we have to be satisfied that the work we do on the review of personal and social education, its content, and the guidance that we put in place on relationships, sexual health and parenthood meets the test that Mr Mundell is putting to me this morning because uh, and, the, and the points that Annie Wells has raised with me. So I think we have to be satisfied that we are um, a, appropriately and effectively demonstrating what is not acceptable. And so the, so the, the educational materials, the process of education has to do that effectively. So I, I will be applying that consideration to the uh, analysis that I undertake of the materials that will come to me uh, as we consider these issues. And that obviously will be material to the piloting that's going on just now of the, uh, the materials uh, in this respect. I was just going to very quickly follow up on the comments you made around the new web resource uh, in your opening statement. Are, are, are you going out to, to groups to, to sort of ask them what they think of that, including the uh, Young Women's Leadership Committee? Are they the sort of people who get asked, you know, do, do these resources uh, meet your satisfaction? Are they, is that the sort of consultation that's ongoing at the moment? Yes, and um, I, I, again, I'm very open to uh, to making sure that we hear the voice of young people in this respect. Uh, I think one of the points that's come out of the research on the PSE review has been um, some feedback, which is, you know, from young people, which has pretty much said this needs to be an awful lot better than it is. So I take that very seriously, which is why we're we're, we're improving the materials that are available. And um, it's important that we hear from young people at all stages about whether or not what they are hearing as part of this process actually is emphatic and informative for them rather than something that they particularly don't have a high opinion of. Um, so we must make sure young people have confidence in the materials that have been taken forward. Mary Fee. Thank you, Convener, and good morning to Cabinet uh, Secretary morning. and his officials. Um, one of the recommendations that, that came out of the work that the Young Women Lead Committee um, has done is that um, sexual, sex and relationship education should be standardised across all schools. And, and, and the question I put to the previous panel was, given that no two schools are the same, and, and the, the type of um, training and education that they want is something that has no option to admit areas or to teach them any differently across the schools. Do you think it's, it's achievable to have a standard across every single school? Um, I, I, well, I think, I think it's possible to have a standard, but I don't think it's possible to have um, an identical approach taken across all schools. The, the, the approach that that is taken through Curriculum for Excellence essentially sets out the outcomes of what we want young people to achieve as a consequence of their education. So these are set out in the experiences and outcomes that are prepared by Education Scotland. And of course, there are experiences and outcomes that are very relevant to the health and wellbeing uh, curricular area within the curriculum. So we set out to schools, these are the experiences and outcomes that we want young people to, uh, to, to, to have. We then also set out the benchmarks of how, of, of what, what, how we visualise the achievement and understanding of young people as a consequence. So the, um, that, that gets set out as a framework and then it's left to individual schools to determine how best and how appropriately they can address those, those issues. 
So I suppose the answer that I would give to the question is that I, I certainly, and it relates also to the point I made to, to Gail Ross a moment ago, I would ex every school has to deliver the health and wellbeing curricular area, has to do justice to it as one of the three primary areas of the curriculum. And within that, personal social education is, is critical in that respect. So that's the standard I would expect to be followed in individual schools. Uh, but obviously, I think it will vary from school to school as to how that is undertaken. And obviously, there's a question of the age appropriateness of the way in which that education is undertaken, which will, of course, vary uh, from age group to age group. And if we accept that there is a, a core that, that must be taught in every school, and there is an element of, of I suppose we could say, flexibility in, in what is topped up or added on, what assessment do you think should be done of that additional part that is left to schools to decide whether they do it or not? Fundamentally, that would be picked up in the, uh, the approach to periodic inspection by in, in Education Scotland, where um, Her Majesty's Inspectorate are looking at you know, what is the educational experience of young people within an individual school. And obviously they are considering that against the expectations that I've just set out in my answer a moment ago to Mary Fee. So that, that would ultimately be, be picked up. There is also the opportunity for us to undertake, as we did in the second phase of the PSE review, a thematic inspection of a topic. So we've, we've undertaken a thematic inspection of PSE within Scottish schools undertaken by Her Majesty's Inspectorate. And of course that's given us some evidence where of um, areas of practice that need to improve, which is then informing the third phase of the PSE review. So those are the two options that I would say are available to ensure that's the case. But I suppose there's also a third, and, and this is something to which um, I, I'm constantly giving attention, is to make sure that we consistently hear the voice of young people in their appreciation and understanding of particular issues in general in society. I think one of the great strengths of the experience that we've had in the Year of Young People in 2018 is that we've more actively than normal sought out the views of young people. And what we've learned from that is that, well, first of all, we're very lucky to have the young people we've got because they are confident individuals with you know, very strong and sometimes uncomfortable opinions about what's going on in society. And secondly, it's not that hard to hear their opinions if you actually try hard enough. So, for example, traditional government consultations would be, you know, these fine people at my side prepare a consultation document, uh, I approve it, it gets sent out in a glossy format or perhaps online and people reply to it and you can pretty much bet your bottom dollar that... Um, not many young people will engage with that form of consultation. But if you engage an organisation like Young Scott or you identify a group like the Young Women Lead Committee and ask them to engage about it, my goodness, you get a completely different proposition. And I think habitually governments learn a pretty blunt lesson in 2018 that A, policy making is better if you get that expression of opinion from young people, and B, it's not that hard to obtain it uh, when you actually think about how you can go about doing that. So um, perhaps fewer glossy publications and more discussions around the table with young people might elicit that information. Yeah, and obviously, I mean, engagement with um, and getting buy-in from teachers, um, pupils and from parents is vital to the success of this. And again, it was a question I asked in, in the, the previous panel to the, the Young Women um, Lead representatives. Um, parent councils and parent forums hold a, a very important place in schools. And when they work well, they are, they are sometimes key to driving success in schools. So how involved would you like to see parent councils and forums in um, sex and relationship education? Would you like to see them involved in some of, of the, the training? Um, because quite often um, getting buy-in from a parent councils can lead to wider conversations with, with other parents, which could help to drive that societal change. But also, I'll just finish my question and then um, I'd be happy to hear your answer. Getting pupils involved in it would be really important as well. So would you like to see um, pupils involved in the, the style and some of the formatting of some of the ma materials that, that are ruled out in schools? 
I, I, I take a fairly open view about all of these questions because th these are these are sensitive topics, and um, on some of the material that's being piloted, um, there's been a bit of media coverage which has highlighted particular elements of that which have caused some parental unease and you know, members of parliament have been writing to me on behalf of constituents about that unease and um, and it's very important that we address these issues satisfactorily for, for parents um, to make sure that we, uh, we are taking an age appropriate approach to these questions. So the, the, so the nature of um, parental involvement, I wouldn't limit it just to parent forums or parent councils. Parental engagement in education is, for me, a much deeper process than being, than, than if we summarise it by membership of a parent council or attending a parents' evening. It's a much deeper process of learning. Our schools are doing so much more to open up their doors to get parents in to be involved in the learning of young people, and I heartily encourage that and welcome it. And I think in this area of policy, that would be helpful, because I, I quite understand the unease that parents have, some parents have expressed to members of parliament about some of the teaching materials that we're looking at. I completely understand the unease, and I'm trying in my response to members of parliament, I've written quite a number of letters to members of parliament addressing these concerns. Um, but if I turn it on its head, as a parent, do I want my child to be educated in the importance of understanding the question of consent? I most certainly do. Definitely. So, and I'd, and I'd, I'd be hard-pressed to find a parent who didn't want that either. So, th th I think we, we just have to have an engaged and open conversation about these points, because I think if we do that, <coughs> we then will be able to address some of that parental unease, activate parental support to reinforce these messages in the home, perhaps help to change deeper cultural attitudes within our society on the points that Gail Ross raised with me, and actually make sure that our that the issues that the Solicitor General is quite fairly putting in front of me saying, look, I need the education system to do more to try to help reduce the rise in sexual offences in our society by better education, then a combination of all of that, I hope, will make a discernible effect and also command parental confidence into the bargain. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Cabinet Secretary, I wonder, um, sometimes I mentioned that some of us can feel uncomfortable with, with the topic, and I, I think... Um, the relationship part of it is actually the important part. It's not, in these things, it's not necessarily about the the, the details of, of sexual relationships for young people. Um, I noticed something online the other day where I think it was a nursery class, as they were entering, would pick how they wished to be greeted, if they wanted a high five, a handshake or a hug. And actually that is teaching about consent and respect and, and bodily autonomy. So mm -hmm. these are the types of things that can... Can assist, and and these are and these are these are some of the fantastic bits of creativity that our education system, and it goes back to my point to Mary Fee about us not sitting in St Andrew's House prescribing. It must be done like this, you know. Everyone must be asked if they wish a high five in the morning, you know. That's uh, you know, I, 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 but but you make a very substantial point, convener, that that actually is an illustration of how you educate a young person about exercising choice. And so, I'm, I, you know, we've got great professionals out there who I'm very confident about the judgment they will make in, in, in this respect, um, but it, it gives us an opportunity to have that, um, uh, an appropriate engagement with young people to, uh, to, to, to identify how to proceed on these questions. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. You know, Deputy First Minister, good morning, and to your officials as well. Um, I would like to talk about the continuum that exists between uh, sexual harassment uh, in, in the sort of physical world and, and sexual exploitation, um, and particularly in the sort of online communities that are 
children and young people now inhabit, that's become a, a more intangible sexual harassment and, and is but still uh, severe nevertheless. It was my privilege to serve on the Ministerial Task Force on Child Sexual Exploitation before I was elected. I just wondered if you could update the committee as to how the, the government's work in terms of uh, the healthy respect agenda and an understanding of sexual exploitation is taking hold in our schools, given that it, it's far less tangible and sometimes more insidious. I think th this is a very good illustration of how we need to be constantly considering over and over again what is the content of the educational approaches that we are taking. And it goes back again to, my, to reinforce my answer to, to Mary Fee. Because if we, I would say in the space of probably no more than seven or eight years, our entire digital interaction as a society has been fundamentally transformed. So if I go back to well, even at the start of this administration in 2007, the degree of digital activity was pretty, you know, felt pretty 19th century by comparison. Um, but now it is absolutely all-consuming in society, and that's happened in a really short space in time. And I think it's a perfect illustration of how our education system has to evolve. Because if we were sitting here saying, well, we wrote the guidance in 2007 as to what you've got to teach in the classroom, it would be pretty irrelevant to the classrooms that young people are now in, uh, occupying in 2018 because of that pace of change. And all we know about what's coming ahead of us is that it's going to change faster than what we've experienced in the course of the last 10 years. So. What, so it's important that we are equipping young people within the education system with an understanding of um, a whole range of different issues, a, a large part of which will be the dangers that they will that will they will be potentially exposed to if they do not carefully and properly safeguard themselves in an online community. And that has to be part of what we are educating young people about in the holistic education that we take forward so that they, uh, they are aware of all of these uh, uh, sentiments. So I would see that as being integral to the, um, to, to the educational materials that we take forward, um, integral to the teaching resource that uh, is taken forward on uh, RSHP, um, and integral to how we equip young people with the capacity to be able to handle these questions. Thank you. Um, I, I said in my first question that sexual exploitation is particularly insidious, and that's largely because in many cases uh, victims of sexual exploitation don't recognise their victimhood. And uh, in many, as a result, you know, if you think about the continuum of sexual harassment, if somebody ping, pings your dr bra strap or gropes you or something, that's a tangible physical violation that you would very likely raise with a teacher. But if it's uh, a relationship you're in that you don't recognise as being inappropriate and you think you're in love, then it's a, a lot harder to, to understand that victimhood and seek help. And in many cases, it's young people themselves that act as that uh, as the peer support for somebody in that situation. Can you describe to the committee how we're supporting young people to uh, be that critical friend at that time of need and say, that that relationship isn't right for you. What does he see in you when he's 10 years older? Is, is there work going on to help support young people to have those difficult conversations? I think that, that's what I see as a necessary outcome of the education that we, are, we undertake on relationships, sexual health and parenthood, that if, if that education process does not create the capacity and the resilience within young people to be able to consider offering some of that advice to a peer group of young people, then I don't think our education is meeting the needs of 21st century young people in Scotland. And those considerations will be very much at the heart of the judgments I make about the guidance and about the contents of the materials, which obviously will be informed by the input of young people. So critical, and it goes back to my, my answer to, to Oliver Mundell a little while ago. Um, if young people look at these materials and say, you know, fine, but not really <laughs> kind of relevant to where we are today, then we've got to go back to the drawing board on those materials. Now, 
I think if we engage young people properly in the formulation process, we should avoid that danger. But the type of judgments that Mr Cole Hamilton puts to me are you know, reasonable expectations for us to expect uh, this process to, to generate within young people. Because fundamentally, what, the, what our approach to the curriculum is trying to do is to create young people who are in command of the four capacities identified in Curriculum for Excellence, but that crucially, as part of that, we have strengthened their resilience. And part of their resilience will be about knowing what consent means, knowing what is appropriate behaviour and what is inappropriate behaviour. And I think Mr Cole Hamilton raises a fair point about, and I think this is an endemic point about cyber activity, I think people can understand in a physical sense what is acceptable and unacceptable. In a cyber sense, I think people don't quite have the same views. And let me just give an example from an earlier discussion I had this week in, in relation to cyber resilience uh, within uh, the country in general. People will lock their front door in the house. They won't think twice about locking their front door because that's what you do. But they won't guarantee in all circumstances they'll lock down their computer or their iPhone or their iPad to give themselves the same protection in their digital space and their device that they've just delivered for their home by locking the front door. Because people are thinking about it differently. So there is a cultural attitude within society where I think on in relation to cyber activity, we all have to think we've got to be much more vigilant in a cyber space. And that's what, you know, when we published the National Action Plan on Internet Safety for Children and Young People in April 2017, that was the type of sentiment we had in our minds to try to encourage within the home to support some of that, uh, that, that education of young people. Thank you. Final question, if I may. Can we uh, just before you do it, oh, yeah. I suppose I, I would just want to, to comment, and in, in no way as a criticism, but... I suppose we just would want the Young Women's Committee to be clear that we hear them when they say that actually most young women don't report the milder sexual yeah. harassment things and actually that silence and shame is is pretty strong. I know you were just framing your question in terms of um, exploitation. No, th but yeah. Thank you for the, that clarification, Convener. And I, I, I absolutely misspoke there. No, that's quite right. And uh, thank you for putting that on the record. My final question takes you back, uh, Deputy First Minister, to your comment about um, the start of your administration, 2007, it being a very different world out there. Um, and I'm reflective of the fact that probably everyone around this table is an immigrant to the information superhighway that we are in, whereas our children and young people are all natives. And there are frontiers um, in this agenda which emerge almost on a weekly basis, new social media platforms, new apps, uh, the rest of it. Um, and, and as such, you know, we, we as policymakers are in the dark here. We're making policy about uh, platforms we don't even know exist in some cases. How much are we enlisting young people? And this goes back to the voice of the child at, at the decision-making table and in co-production around awareness building this. How much are we involving young people as experts in this alien land to us adults um, and so that they can say say to us, well, these new, front, these new platforms are emerged. This is a new sort of uh, fad in terms of what people are sharing. Uh, are they at the table? Um, I think so, but, um, but I think my experience of the Year of Young People makes me question whether they're at the table enough for these questions, because I think the point that Mr Cole Hamilton makes to me is a completely fair point, that young people are closer to this, they're closer to the understanding of it all, they're also closer to the danger of it all. Um, and, and, and that's something that we have to take much greater account of in how we take forward this agenda. So uh, I think one of the points that I will reflect on uh, coming out of the consideration of the, the Young Women Lead Committee and um, out of the committee's deliberations on this question is to satisfy myself that we are taking adequate steps to make sure that young people are sufficiently close to this agenda. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Fulton. Thanks, Camino. Good morning, uh, Deputy First Minister. Um, in the last evidence session, um, just before you came in, I asked the Young Women Lead Committee 
if there was anything they would like to ask yourself. And I think actually in your earlier responses, you've 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 covered much of their questions, particularly around uh, schools not reporting issues because of reputation in your earlier answer to the convener and also to Gail Ross. But one of the questions that they ended with, was there any part of the, the report that you weren't aware of previously? Was there any additional uh, factors or issues brought forward by that report that, that sort of caught your attention? I think the... I, I suppose what I felt reading the report was that I... Um, I suppose I was more stunned by what they recount as their, ex as the, their experience. And I suppose, I don't think the evidence base that is marshalled by the Young Women Lead Committee is particularly different to any evidence base that I have seen before, but it's expressed incredibly powerfully. So I suppose that point, that part of it did stun me when I read the, 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 the connect, the, their account of their experience um, made me think that listening to that expression directly from young women is something that uh, was very powerful in, in their account. Excellent. Uh, and just to, to finish off, uh, convener, the Young Women Lead Committee asked about the um, the action taken over the past six months and the six months to come, and I think in your earlier statement that you, you, you did speak about the work that's been done. What would be your priorities in this um, this area for the, the upcoming six months and further ahead? Well, we have, uh, you know, we, we, we as, as Mr. McGregor uh, accounts, we, we, we have put, um, we, we have undertaken a significant amount of activity in in this area. Um, we've been undertaking the PSE review. Um, we set out the equally safe strategy, which is very important in terms of, um, I think, tackling that wider societal question of the safety and the protection from sexual harassment uh, for um, principally young women. Um, I think the we had an ex in the earlier on this year we launched the measures to tackle gender-based violence in our colleges and universities uh, in response to the uh, the very effective campaign brought forward in tragic circumstances by um, Fiona Drewy um, in tribute to her late daughter uh, Emily and uh, I was pleased that we were able to move so quickly on the implementation of those measures in collaboration with the colleges and universities uh, to address uh, the, 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 the devastating issues that Mrs Drewy has raised with us. Um, and then obviously we have uh, the, the measures we've taken on the strength and guidance on prejudice-based bullying. In the period going forward, uh, obviously once we publish the review of personal and social education, which I will reflect on over the next few weeks, um, we will then take forward the implementation work in that respect by the Lead Officers Network and I want to also make sure within that we have an adequate and strong voice for young people in the process. And uh, from that will flow the development of resources to support schools to address the issue of sexual harassment and to support young people. Um, and I think also in relation to that, we will be um, reviewing the guidance on relationships, sexual health and parenthood. And uh, that flows from the work that we agreed with the LGBTI working group, uh, which obviously I reported to Parliament in my statement some weeks ago. And uh, there is there's quite a substantial amount of agenda that comes out of the LGBTI working group, which is in the similar policy space to some of the work the Young Women Lead Committee uh, were looking at. And, and I'll be anxious to make sure that we, we dovetail all of that together uh, so that it's, it's as effective as it can be. OK, well, thank you very much for your evidence this morning, Cabinet Secretary. Our next meeting will be on Thursday, the 20th of December, when we will take evidence on the budget from the Minister for Older People and Equalities. And I now close the public section of our meeting and ask the public gallery to clear.